Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Happy 2019. Can you believe it has been a year since my last podcast? Boy, I cannot believe that much time has transpired. I want to welcome all of you back. I know so many of you have written to me and asked if I was going to do another podcast. And I, and I apologize so much for not being able to do these I enjoy them immensely, and I, I wish I had more time to get dedicate to doing them. But um, it's been a crazy 2018, and now we're into 2019, and today is the 3rd of January, so it is truly the start of a new year. So uh, what have I been doing all this time? Well, I've been doing a lot of things. Thanks for asking. <laughs> my biggest has been my traveling museum. It is continuing to take up all of my time, which I absolutely love. Don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy it immensely. So it's been uh, a lot of traveling. I, I still remain pretty much here in Texas as far as traveling with the museum. I've done some uh, lecturing outside of Texas. I've done it in a couple of different states, but um, I mostly stay here in Texas. The museum stays mostly here in Texas as well. And I've seen literally hundreds of thousands of kids with this museum, and it is very rewarding. And the, the most exciting part for me is that I'm taking it into communities where uh, some of the children, and quite frankly, a lot of the residents, have just never seen fossils before. Now, mine are replicas. I don't travel with real stuff. But still, it's the idea that they just don't get a chance to ever see dinosaur bones. And so I'm giving them the opportunity to see something that is quite fascinating. And of course, my hope in life is that I can encourage kids to do whatever it is they choose to do. It doesn't necessarily have to be paleontology. I hope it just encourages them to get out there and, uh, um, and, and look at the outdoors and look at the sciences as a possible career and, and look at things from a different perspective. That's my hope. So anyway, that's been the majority. Uh, I went up to Canada. I did a, a series of lectures up in Canada with my friends at the um, uh, Jurassic, uh, Jurassic, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank, Jurassic Forest. Holy smokes. I kept wanting to say Jurassic Fight Club. <laughs> that's, that's seven years ago. The Jurassic Forest um, right outside of Gibbons. It's a beautiful place to go see robotic dinosaurs set up in environments that look so real. You would swear some of these animals are alive. So I went up there. I also flew over to England to drop in and surprise visit my best friend, Alex. Uh, Alex is a very good friend of mine. I was fortunate enough to meet Alex when he and his family came over here to the States Um and we became best of buds. And so I went over there and surprised Alex and got to spend a couple of days with he and his family. And I enjoyed it immensely. It is a beautiful country. And I certainly am making plans now to go back. So I've been a very busy person. And um, I'm glad to finally have time to jump back in here and do a little um uh, do a little podcasting. So anyway, uh, this podcast is going to be very exciting because it is dedicated to one subject, and that is the subject of pterosaurs, uh, the pterodactylids. I am thrilled to uh, have got uh, Dr. Dave Hone to come back again and talk about pterosaurs. And so this entire show is dedicated to the subject of pterosaurs. It's an interview with Dr. Hone. I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy it because I can tell you I learned some really incredible stuff, and I know you will too. So sit back, and we're going to jump right into the interview with Dr. Hone, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And again, for all of you that have stuck around for a year, I hope you're, I hope you're glad I'm back. I know I am. And I hope you guys will enjoy this. So we'll get into right into that interview. We often hear the words flying dinosaurs, but they associate that with pterosaurs. 
And that is not correct. And to help us understand more about these animals that we often just refer to as pterodactyls is someone we had on the previous year, Dr. David Hone. Dr. Hone, welcome back to the show. We are thrilled to have you back with us. Thank you for having me again. So let me ask you, is a pterosaur a dinosaur? No, they're not. Um, pterosaurs, as far as we know, are very close relatives of dinosaurs. So they basically, there was an evolutionary split very close to the origin of dinosaurs um, just after crocodiles evolved. And one of those um, groups went on to become pterosaurs and another group after a few little changes became dinosaurs. So they are very close relatives, but they are not part of that group. We do not consider pterosaurs to be dinosaurs. But they lived at the same time, right? Or they were there when dinosaurs were there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, lots of things were around at the same time. Um, we had the early mammals. There were lizards and snakes and fish. And, of course, even birds later appeared and were still living alongside both dinosaurs and pterosaurs and then marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. So there was loads and loads of stuff around at the same time. That doesn't mean, of course, they're all dinosaurs. Um, and the pterosaurs, you know, are, are a kind of group which kind of fade into the background of these scenes um you know the dinosaurs get all the glory and after that some of the marine reptiles because you know uh some of the um pliosaurs for example were just so enormous that people were really interested in them and then pterosaurs just kind of there um but they had a worldwide distribution we found pterosaurs on all seven continents um as we say they evolved basically at the same time as dinosaurs they went extinct at the same time as dinosaurs so they were around just as long as the dinosaurs were um and we find them in pretty much every environment that they could be found in and indeed you know these were animals were also getting out over the open oceans something that the dinosaurs never really did um so in some ways they were every bit as successful and diverse as the dinosaurs now, see, I'm, I'm surprised at that because in almost all imagery of pterosaurs, we only see one. We see Pteranodon with a big, fancy, big crest on the back yep. of its skull, that being the most iconic one. But as I learned more about pterosaurs, I was stunned at the sheer variety, but also we, we always see them depicted as ocean and as, as sea animals, as reptiles that lived solely along the shores of ancient oceans. But you just said that they were found pretty much everywhere. So their distribution is, is not just limited to marine environment? No. Um, so you can understand where, why, why these misconceptions come about, because um, pterosaurs have astoundingly thin bones. Um, we talk about theropod dinosaurs having, you know, various air sacs and, and hollows in them, and, and so do the sauropod dinosaurs. And birds have this to an even greater degree, so birds have very thin walled bones. Pterosaurs are thinner again. So the bones of pterosaurs are astonishingly thin, and that means actually it's very difficult for them to preserve. That They just break, um, or even just break down, you know, decay very, very easily. Right. Um, and so as a result of that, they only tend to preserve in places where the preservation is absolutely perfect. And most of the time, those kinds of preservation conditions are in the sea or at least in shallow lagoons and, and kind of bay areas. So it's mostly an artifact of the preservation. We simply can't find pterosaurs, or at least they're just incredibly hard to find in classic inland environments. So even though they were there in large numbers and as far as we can tell, reasonable diversity, we just don't find them. Um, but then, yeah, Pteranodon in particular is known from over a thousand specimens, uh, which is a hell of a lot. I mean, that, that's an awful lot. You know, most dinosaurs can't begin to touch those kinds of numbers. Now, admittedly, a lot of them are, Pteranodon are very fragmentary, they're very broken, they're very incomplete, there's only a few bits of wing or a few bits of leg or a head. But a thousand specimens is an awful lot. And so we probably know more about Pteranodon than any other pterosaur and it was very big and as you say it's an iconic big head big crest it was one of the first pterosaurs found um and so it's perhaps not a big surprise that it's kind of seeped into the consciousness as kind of like you know the pterosaur um but we have give or take 150 species or so that have been named that's nothing like as many of the dinosaurs which are coming in more like a thousand but again pterosaurs are 
pterosaur fossils are very few and far between. So I'd be, you know, their diversity was almost certainly considerably higher. We just can't find the fossils. Well, with that number of named species, can you give us a, a general idea of size range? Because we always think of pterosaurs as they're always showing either a small airplane or a hand yeah. glider. But but what are the what are some of the what are some of the size ranges of these animals? Yeah, so so the the big ones really were just as you've described. Um, there's things like Quetzalcoatlus, Aramborgiania, um, and a whole bunch of others, which are a group called the Ajdarkids. And yet yeah, these were huge, absolutely enormous, ten meters plus in wingspan, um, 250, maybe 350 kilos, which is extraordinarily heavy for a flying animal, but on the other hand, very light for an animal with a 10 meter wingspan. Um, so the upper size range is, you know, massive, multiple times bigger than the largest flying birds, bigger by far than the largest extinct flying birds that we know of. Pterosaurs were huge. At the small scale, it starts to get very complicated. Um, you will often see people discuss pterosaurs with a wingspan of, you know, 20 to 30 centimeters, even down to kind of 15, maybe even 10. We certainly have specimens of animals that size. What we do not have is adults of that size. Um, we think that pterosaurs could probably fly as juveniles. Uh, some people, including me, think they could probably fly within days or weeks of hatching out of the egg. So much, much faster than most birds or things like bats manage, for example. Um, but the smallest adult pterosaurs that we know of were actually around a meter in wingspan. So that's pretty big. That's kind of the size of a crow or so. Um, so there were definitely smaller pterosaurs than that that could fly. Um, but the smallest adults were about a meter. So actually, you know, compared to birds, where, you know, and, and bats where you've got animals with, you know, 10 centimeter wingspans as adults, um, hummingbirds, um, things like the bumblebee bat, the smallest pterosaurs were actually quite large. God, that is amazing. And, and of course, like with the general public, the big things always seem to, to we gravitate our attention towards well, those. Well, of course. We do. <laughs> <laughs> so my question would be, Let's take an animal like Quetzalcoatlus, since I'm here in Texas, yep. and that's one of our iconic creatures. How does that animal become airborne? Does it have the musculature to flap its wings and fly? What is your opinion of that? Yeah, so again, this is this is a this is another classic thing of the the idea that the very largest pterosaurs were, you know, terrestrial. Basically, they they couldn't fly. They were too big. They were too heavy. They couldn't get into the air. Um, there's lots of reasons to think that isn't true. Um, for a start, we have loads and loads of flightless birds. There's, you know, everyone knows things like ostriches and penguins, but there's a whole bunch of lineages which have basically lost the ability to fly. There's a whole bunch of grebes. There's things like the kakapo in New Zealand, the flightless parrot, uh, things like kiwis. Uh, there used to be a flightless wren in New Zealand. This has happened many, many times, and we see some systematic changes with the loss of flight. And one of them, really unsurprisingly, is that the wings get smaller. You know, if you're not flying, evolution will soon get rid of those big, heavy wings and those massive flight muscles right. because you're just not using them. And even the biggest pterosaurs have properly developed wings and properly developed joints on those wings and, and places to attach muscles. So... If Quetzalcoatlus couldn't fly, it's still got all of the flight musculature um, and all the wing proportions of a flying animal, which is a very odd thing to have done. So that, you know, immediately makes it look very unlikely. Similarly, flightless birds tend to stop having those super thin bones. Their bones start to thicken up again because losing weight is less of a problem. Being strong so you don't break your bones while you run around on the ground is more of a, a more of a thing to have. Quetzalcoatlus doesn't have that. The Ashdarkids have proportionally the thinnest bones of pterosaurs, which is what you'd expect from flying animals. Um, so there's a bunch of things to assume that you know, will make it look like they did fly. So it's a reasonable assumption that they did. Then we can actually look at the mechanics. Could they get off the ground and fly? And, well, actually, if you run the numbers, there's a friend and colleague of mine called Mike Khabib down in Los Angeles who's done an awful lot of this work. And, yeah, it looks really pretty fine that they could get off the ground. Um, and this is because pterosaurs are actually built a lot more like 
bats than they are like birds. Uh, a problem in the past is people have looked at birds and gone, well, you know, you get albatross and condors getting up to, you know, three, four meters in wingspan and they they struggle to fly at the best of times. And these animals are, you know, in the tens of kilos. How are you going to get something that's 10 plus times that heavy into the air? And the thing is, birds are kind of weird because they walk around on their back legs on the ground. And then in the air, they're propelled entirely by their front legs their wings and so actually they need two entirely independent sets of muscles to do that they need muscles that are strong enough to let them run around and indeed jump to take off and they need muscles strong enough to flap around and in both cases they're kind of now carrying the extra weight because when they're flying in particular they're now carrying all that extra weight of heavy legs what bats do is almost the sensible way round, in that actually most of the energy they're expelling while on the ground to walk and indeed run things like vampire bats can run and jump which most people don't expect they gallop like horses quite literally there's some wonderful videos of this online which i suggest people look up wow. um wow. but they're doing that with their front legs the majority of that power and energy is coming from their forelimbs and their flight muscles and their back legs aren't really doing very much so when they take off they're not taking off with those back legs. They're taking off with their massively powerful front legs. And the back legs aren't doing very much. So this is a brilliant kind of multiple saving because you're jumping off with the powerful muscles. And then once you're in the air, you don't need to lug around all those extra heavy, almost like dead weight of your legs. And this is what pterosaurs do. On the ground, pterosaurs were quadrupeds. They're walking on all fours. We can see that their hind legs are incredibly spindly. They have a reduced pelvis, so there's not a lot of leg muscles on there, but their chest muscles are huge. So as far as we can tell, and again, the various, various biomechanical studies bear this out, um, they have that forelimb power to jump off the ground and launch, and then they have that forelimb power combined with relatively lightweight legs and then relatively lightweight skeletons even compared to birds which means that proportionally they're not that heavy they've got the extra muscle they can get themselves into the air and flap around quite happily that's amazing and i guess like a hand glider once it's airborne it doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort to glide right yeah, not not necessarily. So again, that there's it, it gets a bit more complicated than that quite quickly, inevitably. Um, but yes, if you're an inland animal, most Ashdarkids, as far as we can tell, lived you know inland. They're not coastal animals. They're not like gulls and launching off cliffs and landing back near cliffs and getting those kinds of winds off the sea. They're relying, as far as we can tell, on thermals, so hot columns of air from patches of the ground that heat up. Um, that would certainly get them up. Ajdarkids generally in Quetzalcoatlus um, certainly seem actually to have the power to fly properly, um, by which I mean, yeah, you're talking about things like condors and buzzards, which can certainly flap to take off, but really get most of their height and distance from thermal soar and catching this warm air. Undoubtedly, things like Quetzalcoatlus were doing that, but Quetzalcoatlus actually seems to be more have more power and more endurance than those kinds of animals. So actually, they could probably flap a fair way as well. Um, so it's it's actually a mixture of both. They almost certainly were massively efficient, as you say, catching the air, using that to drift. You know, miles and miles and miles, tens, maybe hundreds of miles. Um, but these guys could flap pretty well too. Again, they they've actually they're built better than birds for want of a better expression with that distribution of muscles and and, and lack of hind limb mass that they need to lug around that's, a, that's amazing well obviously they're needing to travel to find food sources is mm -hmm. there is there any evidence that helps you figure out what it is these animals are eating because again i go back to these iconic images we all see which is a pterosaur swooping down and grabbing a fish out of the water and and that's repeated yeah. a million times in books, but is that the case or was it more diverse than that? It, it was certainly more diverse than that. Um, so again, we have pterosaurs living in land. Um, now, obviously that doesn't rule out fish when there's rivers and lakes, but that's probably not their, their gonna be their main source of food. Um, but yeah, we have pterosaurs that were definitely hanging around coastlines, pterosaurs that were flying well out to sea, but pterosaurs that also lived 
well inland. And we see a variety of adaptations uh, in the skulls in particular. Once you rule out the skull, pterosaurs are pretty similar to each other. They fall into two broad groups. Um, but the heads are where where it's at pretty much we definitely have pterosaurs that look like specialist insect eaters they have very small broad heads with a few fine spike like teeth just like most insectivorous bats and to be honest like an awful lot of insectivorous lizards uh, we're pretty happy that those are fundamentally insectivores um, we have some with some kind of big spiky teeth and little processing teeth um, which appear to be kind of generalist carnivores, maybe generalist omnivores, so in other words, eating little animals, eating insects, maybe taking a bit of fruit or something like that. Um, we have lots which are specialized for fish. Again, that's not a big surprise. As we said, most of the fossils come from marine sediments. A lot of the pterosaurs that we do know of were definitely living in and around coastlines. Um, we have some which were filter feeders. Again, probably eating small fish and things like that, but also small crustaceans so have loads and loads and loads and loads of teeth um so either snatching tiny fish or you know doing something maybe flamingo like and pumping the tongue to move water through and, and filter out tiny things uh we have a few what are called durophagus animals so these are things that eat hard things um there's a whole group of these uh from china called the singeripterids i've worked on them quite a bit uh, and they have these giant crushing teeth at the back of the jaws. Uh, and these lived in a basically around a giant inland sea or even an inland lake. It was fresh water uh, in the middle of a desert. Uh, and as far as we can tell, it was full of things like clams and crabs. And so these guys were presumably hooking them out and then crushing these things and then swallowing the remainder. And then we have the Ejdarkids, which we think are probably big predators of whatever they could get down their mouths. They had huge heron-like bills or stork-like bills, and they're probably hunting like some of the big terrestrial storks, um, things like marabou storks. So maybe they were scavenging a bit, um, but they were probably also gulping down baby dinosaurs, larger mammals, snakes, anything like this. And then there's a few pterosaurs where, frankly, we don't really know what they were eating. There's hints that they were eating fish there's hints that they were scavengers there's hints that they were eating fruit there's hints that they were eating leaves um we really don't know because they have very odd skull shapes um they look kind of like terrestrial fruit eaters but then we only ever find them in the sea but then that could be because they live near the sea and again that's where you'll tend to find the fossils um so so that's a group the, the tapiarids in particular and those are a real confusion and an endless source of argument we we don't know what those were eating <laughs> well you mentioned teeth so yeah. when we when we go into museums the majority either have the skeleton or a a uh, a, a reproduced body mount of the pteranodon and there's no teeth in its mouth and yet you're referring to teeth in some of these so some pterosaurs had teeth some did not yeah so all of the earliest pterosaurs had teeth and most of them had a huge number of teeth um then the number reduced quite radically um during getting on to kind of the the early cretaceous uh, several different lineages independently lost their teeth. So this happened multiple times, just like the dinosaurs. We have multiple different groups at various times decided to ditch teeth and go for beaks. Pterosaurs did the same thing. Pteranodon was one group. Um, a, depending on who you speak to, a close relative of Pteranodon called Nyctosaurus. Um, Nyctosaurus definitely didn't have teeth, depending on who you speak to, is whether or not it's a close relative of Pteranodon. Um, the Ashdarkids and the Tapiarids and their relatives, they all form a group that we've talked about. All of them have lost their teeth. And a couple of others reduced it heavily as well. Um, and again, so that's also covering a diversity of forms. It's not like it's just the fish eaters did this. Um, the big group, which is a close relative of Pteranodon is a group called the uh, Ornithochirids, and they had loads of big teeth. Um, they were fish eaters too. They were doing the same thing that Pteranodon was, but Pteranodon appears to have gone for a toothless way of grabbing fish. Ornithochirids have gone for big spiky fang-like teeth to grab fish, so they're much more like crocodiles or dolphins um, in that respect, rather than you know most modern fishing birds um so clearly you can do a similar thing in a different way and you know at various times evolution goes down different routes but there were both toothed and toothless pterosaurs wow now what about tails 
because we see images of some having long extended tails and, and others having none or what appears to be none. So is that a variety yeah. as well? Yeah, but that, that that's so as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So there are, there are basically two main groups of pterosaurs as ever. It's a little more complicated than that. The earliest pterosaurs um, are a group called non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs. In other words, they're not the pterodactyloids, which we'll get onto in a second. The non-pterodactyloids are generally small, mostly under two meters um, at adult. There's a few pretty big ones, which are creeping over two meters, but mostly they're under that. Um, they have smallish heads, shortish necks. They do have a long tail. And then in the wing, uh, what's called the metacarpal. So this is the bone which in us makes up the, basically the the kind of palm of the hand. Obviously we have five because of our five fingers. Um, pterosaurs will have one giant metacarpal because they're flying off a single finger, which is actually the fourth. The wing metacarpal in non-pterodactyloids is, is really short. It's like one of the shortest bones in the hand. And then the second major group is, unsurprisingly, the pterodactyloids. And they have the reverse of this. They have really big heads, they have really long necks, they have a very short tail, and they have a huge wing metacarpal in some, including Quetzalcoatlus. It's the longest bone in the wing. Um, so that's basically your, your two divisions. There's actually a group that kind of sits between the two, which have only been known about for about 10 years. So this used to be one of the great mysteries I would argue, of vertebrate paleontology, not just pterosaurs, all vertebrate paleontology, is you have the non-pterodactyloids and the pterodactyloids, and they are really very different from each other. And the question is, how and when did they transition? Because if you look to the late Jurassic, we have both groups living together. The Solnhofen limestones of Germany, which give us things like Archaeopteryx, which most people are familiar with, you know, the first bird. We have loads of pterodactyloids and loads of non-pterodactyloids. So at some point before the late Jurassic, this group split. And we didn't know when, and we didn't know how. And then this small group of pterosaurs turned up, which sit wonderfully between the two. They are a brilliant example of an evolutionary transition. They have a relatively small head, on a relatively short neck, which is non-pterodactyloid-like. Sorry, excuse me. They have a relatively long head and long neck, which is pterodactyloid-like. I've just got that backwards. That's terrible of me. <laughs> so, but, so a long head and a long neck. They then have a long tail, which is non-pterodactyloid-like. And their metacarpals are short, but quite a bit longer than the other non-pterodactyloids. So it's like the head and neck turned into a pterodactyloid head and neck, and then later the rest of the body caught up. And we're now, now again, that we understand this and we recognize this, we're starting to find a whole bunch of these. Um, the first ones that we found were from the middle Jurassic of China, so it's exactly the time that you'd expect, just before the late Jurassic, where the pterodactyloids first appear properly. So they're from the right, they're from the right time. We've now got one from England, which shows this transition, and we've got two different ones from Germany, again, Solnhofen, one of which looks just like the Chinese and the European and the English one, the other of which actually looks rather more like a pterodactyloid. Um, so the wings are looking much more pterodactyloid-like, and it's got an even bigger head um, than this intermediate group, but still not quite as big as the pterodactyloids. So we're actually starting to see you know, that huge disparity where if you like there was black and there was white we've already found one band of gray and now we're starting to find some other shades of gray between gray and black so it's really starting to turn into a continuum now we've got more and more fossils um and we're starting to see that pattern um but to go back to the original question yeah there's a fundamental split between long tails and short tails um, but that doesn't mean that you don't see loads and loads of toys of things that look very pteranodon-like, which then have a great big long tail at the end, which they really shouldn't. <laughs> well, how satisfying is it if from, as a, from a scientist's perspective to be able to, to find those connections of the gradual evolutionary change of animals? Because so much of that is missing in paleontology either because we don't have access to formations or they just haven't found those transitional animals. How satisfying is that for you to be able to literally see those transitions occurring in the fossil record? 
Oh yeah, I mean it's absolutely incredible. I mean that this is this is one of those things which I as a you know as a pterosaur researcher just thought we wouldn't get. You know, we we assumed that there was some rapid burst of evolution. You know, probably somewhere that we'd never find the fossils. You know, big changes like this can happen very very rapidly under the right circumstances, and therefore you know it's perfectly plausible that one small island somewhere within half a million years the first pterodactyloids appeared, spread around the globe, and you know that island then sank into the ocean and. You know, there's literally no fossil record to be found. That's kind of what I assumed probably happened. Um, and so the idea that we'd ever find a really good transitional fossil, something that really fit exactly between the two, maybe we'd shade the edges together a bit, but something that really showed you how they went together. Um, again, what evolved first? We now know it's the head and neck that evolved first. Um, I, I didn't think would ever appear. So when this thing was first announced... You know, there were pretty much jaws on the floor. I don't get to too many paleontology conferences, unfortunately, but I happened to be at the one where this was done. It was the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference in Bristol. Um, you know, and there were pretty much jaws on the floor. And then, you know, the first question that came up, well, actually, it was it was kind of forestalled. But the, the, the inevitable question, for, you could see people thinking about this, is this was at the time when there had been a couple of high-profile faked fossils coming out of China. Um, and the assumption was is that, you know, someone's been sold a dud and some guy has given you two, you know, with a head glued onto a body right. and you think you've got something amazing and you kind of haven't. And no, they knew this was going to be a problem and they went, here's the photos of us preparing <laughs> this in our lab. We, when someone showed this to us, we assumed that it was dodgy because no <laughs> yeah. one, we, you know, we as pterosaur researchers couldn't believe that this was a real, you know, it's obviously the wrong head on the wrong body. And so we took it into the lab and, you know, did the, did the work ourselves, made sure no one else touched the damn thing. And yeah, it's real. Um, so, uh, you know, and then of course, once you know that you start looking at, you know, you, you've got more evidence to go with. So, you know, this is one of these, things where you know from an evolutionary perspective it's enlightening but it also then gets you to look at other things with a new eye so i mentioned you know there's this british um pterosaur which uh, you know appears to be one of these transitional forms and it had been uh, you know entirely understandably assumed to have been a bit of an odd pterodactyloid because it's basically just a head and people went, well, you know, it, it's like a pterodactyloid because it's got a great big long head and it's got all these classic pterodactyloid features of the head, but it's kind of a bit weird. So we just assume it's an odd one. But of course, once you now know that there are things out there which kind of look like a pterodactyloid head but aren't quite, you then go back to specimens like that. And lo and behold, yeah, it's... It's late Jurassic, sure, but that's around the time these things should still be out there. It's not too far from Germany, being from the south of the UK. You start comparing it to the German one, you start comparing it to the Chinese ones, and lo and behold, it's now fairly obvious in hindsight, because you've got all the extra data and extra information, that, yeah, this is another case of one of those transitional animals, and then it helps fill the gap in a little better. Um, so, yeah, it, it's amazing to get this kind of information and understanding but as ever, it actually breeds new understanding and appreciation and allows you to bring in, you know, other information that you didn't have before or didn't know that you had. That's that's so amazing. That's pretty cool. OK, so eggs. Did, ter yes. did pterosaurs uh, lay eggs or did they give live birth or both? What, what do you think? Um, as far as we know, they all laid eggs. So um, all modern birds lay eggs or crocodiles lay eggs and the or crocodilians and these are the two groups that kind of bound both dinosaurs and pterosaurs birds are the literal descendants of dinosaurs and crocodiles are the nearest living relatives and as far as we know every dinosaur laid eggs we've never found any evidence of live birth in dinosaurs that you might from getting say an embryo in a chest cavity without an eggshell we found them for lots of other things that give birth to live young so ichthyosaurs plesiosaurs we have these we'd expect to find them for dinosaurs if they gave birth to live young we never have um pterosaurs are in the same boat um so yeah we've always been on the assumption that for some reason this whole group, this is collectively called the archosaurs, 
dinosaurs, birds, pterosaurs, crocodilians, never evolved life bearing, even though a whole bunch of lizards and lizard relatives and snakes and things did. Um, but pterosaur eggs were basically unknown, even though, you know, we've had dinosaur eggs for well over 100 years. Pterosaur eggs we didn't have until... I'm trying to remember the date now. I think it was 2001, it may have been 2003, where we suddenly got two in the same issue of one journal and then another one turned up a few weeks later. Um, we now have, actually we now have a lot of eggs um, from only about two years ago, this entire new fossil bed of pterosaurs, uh, a group called, uh, uh, an animal called Hamipterus. Uh, from Western China has turned up, and that has preserved dozens of eggs uh, and dozens of embryos. Before that, we had, you know, you could count the pterosaur eggs basically on one hand. Um, we had one from Argentina, uh, which is one from one of the filter feeders, um, and then we had two or three from China, the, the famous Liaoning beds where basically all the feathered dinosaurs are from. Um, again, exceptional preservation. You get feathers, you actually tend to get pterosaurs because the preservation is so good, they tend to survive. So we had a handful of pterosaur eggs and a couple of them had embryos in, which again was in incredible news. Now we've suddenly got dozens of pterosaur eggs, um, but that research is kind of being done at the moment. Um, so it'll be, a, it'll be a while before we know too much more. Um, but what do we know about pterosaur eggs? Well, they were pretty large, given the size of the pterosaur, but not huge. Some birds have absolutely enormous eggs for their body size. I'd say in rough ratios, you're kind of talking about, you know, duck eggs, chicken eggs, you know, quite big for the size of the animal, but not massive. They were relatively thin shelled, so they'd have come out rather like crocodile eggs or even turtle eggs. Um, you know, almost kind of papery, kind of soft. You know, you'd actually have to squeeze them quite hard to break them, unlike, say, a classic bird's egg, you know, which is actually, you know, you have to crack an egg, you know, you have to really quite beat it to get through the shell. Um, and the embryos that hatched for the, from them were pretty big and, as I said earlier, you know, probably basically ready to fly. Um, they have very well ossified bones. Um, the bones are strong. You know, very young animals, babies, tend to have very soft, thin bones. Um, what they do tend to firm up are the bones they're going to use. So things like baby antelope when they're born, they run within hours of being born. Their legs are pretty well put together, the rest of the skeleton less so. Uh, and, and the legs are well grown, you know, they, they, they're big and then they're strong bones. This is what we see in the embryonic pterosaurs. They've grown a full wing. All the wing finger bones are there, and they're pretty well ossified. This is not what you'd expect for an animal that's not going to fly for weeks or months. Um, bats, when they hatch out, the claws are really big and strong because they've got to hold on either to mum or the roof. The wings, there's barely anything of them. They're actually really small, and they're very weak. Not what we see with pterosaurs. So the implication, again, is that these things are hatching and they are maybe ready to fly. Again, very, very hard to say if we're talking, you know, hours, days, a couple of weeks, but definitely not, you know, months, um, as you'd expect for comparably sized birds and bats. Um, so young pterosaurs were flying. And that's supported by some other evidence. For example, things like, some of the smallest pterosaurs that we talked about um, are from marine sediments, and they're from quite a long way out to sea. Well, okay, if the babies were hanging around on land, sure, occasionally they might die and fall in the water, and then the water might, you know, currents might drift them out in, you know, well away from the coastline. But we keep finding large numbers of them out there. That shouldn't be happening. That would be very unlikely to happen so many times. What's far more likely is they're out there because they were flying out there when they died, presumably from some kind of accident. But that seems much more plausible to me. So, yeah, the skeleton looks like they're ready to fly. And where we actually tend to find them suggests that they're flying. God. Now, the, the eggs that are found, are these found in an actual nest? Or were these just individual eggs? And if they were found in a nest, are they nesting on the side of a mountain like like shorebirds will do? Are they nesting on the ground? What what 
What do you think? Yeah, so we, we have no pterosaur nests, frustratingly. Um, based on the, the fact that actually the, the eggshell itself is really soft, that means it would dry out very quickly. Um, this is unlike a bird egg. So uh, the implications for this is that these are almost certainly buried in some way. Oh, wow. In soft earth, maybe with some vegetation, probably something a lot like a modern alligator or crocodile nest. That that much we do know for the eggs that we have. Uh, Hamitrus, which I mentioned, which has these huge numbers of eggs from China. Unfortunately, those eggs were all kind of buried in equivalent of like a mudslide so if they were in a nest it's all been disturbed because basically there are bones of adults and babies and embryos and eggs all mixed up together so if there was a nest we haven't got it anymore that doesn't mean we won't find one in the future because obviously if there's a big enough mudslide that buried everything hopefully somewhere you know there's an original intact nest um so we don't have nests right now um we wouldn't probably find nests from anything nesting more like a shorebird because that's not the kind of place that you'll ever get deposits. Um, you know, you might, if you were very lucky, find a fossil nest of something like a crow. You know, big nest up a tree, happened to be over water, the entire nest falls in the water and gets buried. You're not going to get that from something, you know, like a gull or a puffin living on a cliff. <laughs> you just don't get deposits there. And if it does fall into the water, it's going to be beaten up by the waves long before it gets buried. Right. So, yeah, I'm sure things like Pteranodon were nesting on cliffs or hilltops or maybe even beaches if it's a nice protected cove, you know, in the way that seals and sea lions do now because it keeps the predators away. But, you know, that's the kind of thing we're just never going to find. Uh, I've said that many times and then been proved wrong, but this one I'm pretty... <laughs> This one I'm pretty confident of. Um, inland, some, again, Hemitrus may yet turn up. Um, it, it remains to be seen. But again, it's it's going to be horses for courses. You know, things like Ashdarkids, which are living, you know, in continents, things like Sungaripterus, which is living on the margin of a lake in the middle of a desert, are not going to be building nests in the same places that... Pteranodon is that lives out over the ocean and spends most of its time out over the water. Um, so we'd probably expect to see at least some variety there, if only in, you know, the places that they pick, but probably also quite how they built them and, you know, what materials are available is going to be different here, there and everywhere. Right. So having that softer shell, you wouldn't expect a like a bird for the female to sit on the nest or sit on a clutch right um i i'm not sure they probably could um you know birds you know we watch birds nest you know we've got these famous things like you know various brooding dinosaurs um you know they're crouching down spreading the arms out and the, the feathers of the body and the arms would neatly cover uh, the eggs and help keep them warm or keep them insulated. Pterosaurs can't really sit like that. Um, now, pterosaurs did have feather-like filaments. Um, there's been some very recent studies, like in the last two weeks, um, suggesting that those body filaments may indeed be at some level evolutionarily the same as feathers. Whether or not you want to call them feathers is another argument, um, but certainly pterosaurs had feather-like filaments on the bodies and to a degree on the wings these are called pycnofibers um that would presumably potentially act as something like a feather-like insulator in the way that birds sit on the nest but i think the physical shape of the pterosaur is going to make that very very difficult um i wouldn't rule it out I'd be surprised if they were brooding animals. Um, plus, also, again, you've got to remember these these eggs need to be kept moist, and actually warming them up too much with your body, you might actually risk, you know, drying them out. Um, so they're probably better off burying them and leaving them. Wow. So you mentioned fur and feathers. Yeah. The earliest imagery as a kid I grew up with was these things were looked like naked mole rats. They had no, yeah. they were just skin. But yeah. then later images started to show them having a furry body. So mm -hmm. what what is the fact that based on the evidence of today that, that what, what did they have feathers? Did they have fur? Were they hairless? 
Well, so, sorry. So, so I mean, f fur is kind of restricted to to mammals. So let, let's uh, let's right. dump fur as a word. Uh, right. It's about so, uh, so, fur like or fur yeah, from the right. imagery. So, so yeah. So, so these these are definitely very clearly filamentous structures. So they 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 are they certainly like individual hairs, or they're like the feathers you get on things like baby birds on chicks. Right. You know, they're they're kind of single strands, or maybe a little cluster of strands terminating at a point let's 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 say that so very much like hair fur feathers of baby birds early on we assumed pterosaurs were naked and scaly because it was entirely you know these were very obviously reptiles right. it was entirely reasonable to assume that that was their primary covering we were finding the wings we were finding wing membranes and things like the the vein that you get on the tail of the long-tailed pterosaurs um, and some other bits um, but we didn't really have proper skin or any kind of body covering. Scales were not an unreasonable assumption. In fact, it was an extremely reasonable assumption. Um, and then a specimen turned up from Kazakhstan in, I think, the mid to late 50s, and then it was first described in the 60s. Uh, an entity called Sordis pelosus, the hairy devil. And this thing, there's two or three specimens of them that they're held in an institute in Moscow, are very obviously covered in these filaments, what we now call pycnofibers, basically head to tail. And any part of the body had pycnofibers on it, quite long. You know, this would have been a fairly, not necessarily shaggy, but, you know, th these aren't tiny little tight bristles. You know, this was an animal properly covered in fluff and presumably looked like most baby birds, maybe a you know a hamster or something like that you know smooth um but very distinctly fuzzy um following on from sorties there was a big gap and then we started finding a bunch of others like this there's a whole bunch of specimens in china inevitably again areas of exceptional preservation good enough to preserve pterosaurs good enough to preserve skin you start finding things like these these filaments um, and we now have a handful of pterosaur species that show these pycnofibers on the body. And these include some of the earliest pterosaurs that we know of. Um, so animals from the Middle Jurassic, um, which we think actually have a rather older ancestry. These are rather late survivors. So certainly some of the earliest, e in evolutionary terms, pterosaurs, had these pycnofibers and the reasonable assumption is once these things have evolved they probably were retained in most if not all lineages so our assumption is basically all pterosaurs were fuzzy they had these pycnofibers on the body almost certainly they had bare bits we've actually got some pterosaur the soles of their feet preserved we can see those have scales like modern birds again not a big surprise you know you don't really want to be walking around on your fur you want to be walking around on scales that'll give you some grip um so they weren't like a hundred percent furry certainly things like pterandodon has a big beak that's not going to be furry maybe things like quetzalcoatlus had a relatively bald head if it was living in a really hot environment didn't want to overheat maybe desert dwelling pterosaurs had much less covering um we don't know we don't have the direct evidence for that there's some reasonable speculation there but you know as a first approximation all pterosaurs had pycnofibers the question has been for some time are these in some evolutionary sense basically the same as feathers could you literally call them feathers was there a to rephrase was there a single evolutionary origin of these fibers which were then inherited on the one hand by pterosaurs and on the other hand by carnivorous dinosaurs, which ultimately gave rise to birds. And the thing is, we don't know. But it's an extraordinarily intriguing question, because if, if that's true, that means that a whole bunch of dinosaurs may well have had feathers that we didn't think did. It also means that feathers at some level were lost on multiple different occasions in various different dinosaur lineages, basically only leaving them present in the birds and the, the ancestors of birds, you know, the dromaeosaurs and troodontids and actually even tyrannosaurs and a few other things. Um, but we don't know. Um, as I say, there's a very recent paper that suggested that actually pycnofibers and feathers were closer to each other than we had thought and suggested that they may have a true single origin um obviously more work needs to be done on that and even if that is true it 
doesn't mean that every dinosaur is feathered. We've got enough of them preserved with skin. We know full well that plenty of them weren't. But it certainly is an extremely important question. Um, because the other possibility is that they're just really, really similar. Um, but then that opens up some new questions. Does it mean that there was something lurking around in the genes of these animals that made it, you know, relatively easy? That they were already had maybe some genes that would allow scales to turn into these filaments. And if it's that you know, easy, it's, it's a very dodgy word, I know, to use in evolutionary terms, but as in it may not require much selection pressure or it may not require many mutations, then these things could come and go quite easily. That may explain why pterosaurs have filaments. A couple of groups of ornithischian dinosaurs have filaments, and then, of course, the birds as well. So that's this whole question of did these things evolve once or twice or three or four times and how many times did they evolve and how many times were they lost and exactly which groups had them and when did they get them and when did they lose them and why did they lose them is unfortunately a giant mess at the moment but any of the answers will be absolutely fascinating um and are at some level key to answering you know part of the questions of how did we get birds because we know that feathers weren't you know initially for flight they go all the way back to big you know, one ton tyrannosaurs. But the question is, did they then go back another hundred plus million years, all the way back to the earlier, even middle Triassic? And then they're floating around with maybe even some non dinosaurs, you know, <clears throat> things like dinosauromorphs and again, pterosaurs potentially. And so, uh, you know, do they even go back to crocodiles? It's not impossible at that point. <laughs> Were, were, were there fuzzy crocodiles if you went back 260 million years? And maybe crocs ditched them for scales when they became aquatic. We don't know. That's ex that's exciting, though. It's, it's exciting <coughs> to think about. I mean, that's just... Well, so with with a lot <laughs> of the latest uh, latest information, there are paleontologists now that are able to start to determine color that is, I guess, for layman's terms, color pigment that's trapped in those fibrous things. Yeah. If that is the case, do do you know of any work or any future work that might come from that to help us understand the coloration of pterosaurs? Yeah. So I, so so the group that published a paper just a couple of weeks ago, talking about pycnofibers and 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 their their potential evolutionary history with feathers did that and said these guys were brown um now the ones they were working on a, a, a group called the anurignathids that i myself have done an awful lot of work on um anurignathids are these small insect hunting animals that i mentioned earlier they got anurignathid means frog jaw they have very rounded frog-like heads with little spiky teeth um and we think these things may have even been nocturnal and they really are acting like bats not hanging upside down but like frog mouths and potus and some of these other birds um they're flying around grabbing little insects on the wing and then probably hiding on tree trunks or <clears throat> excuse me um you know in holes in trees that is not a big surprise if those guys are brown um another group a few years ago published a paper looking at color in dinosaurs and frustratingly buried in the depths of one of their supplementary files they go oh we had a look at this pterosaur too and it was brown and it's like in like three lines or <laughs> like even one line <laughs> if you bothered to read through like 20 extra pages of data um and nothing else has come out of it and that's basically it so we've got like a couple of pterosaurs that we think were probably brown but they're both inland animals that lived in heavily forested environments this is not a surprise to anyone so at one level it's amazing we've got this data on the other hand it's not like we're testing the kind of pterosaurs which would be a lot more interesting now here you have a twofold problem First of all, the ones which might be a lot more interesting, like Pteranodon, like Quetzalcoatlus, for example, the Tapiarids, mostly we don't have pycnofibers for them, so there's nothing to test. The other problem is, you know, you think feathers are rare on dinosaurs. Pycnofibers on pterosaurs are, you know, hen's teeth. These are gold dust. These are staggeringly rare. And the problem with very, very, very rare fossils is that they are then very, very valuable. And currently, the only way we can check for things like color is to literally physically go in and take a chunk off the specimen and then put it into some kind of very expensive 
analysis machine to tell us what the chemicals were and what structure it was. And oddly enough, museums don't like it when you do that to very, very, very expensive fossils. Um, I actually used to be part of the research group who just published this newspaper. And I lived in China for three years. I worked with my Chinese colleagues out there on a whole bunch of pterosaurs. And when I joined the research group that was looking at, among other things, color in dinosaurs, the first thing I did is email every pterosaur researcher and every museum curator with a pterosaur in it that had pycnofibers and said, can I take a chunk off your specimen? And they either didn't reply, which means <laughs> no, or they replied and said no. <laughs> so it's great that there's been this like little breakthrough, but I don't think much is going to happen for a while because the specimens are too rare and the procedure is destructive. Um, you know, we've we've done so Anchiornis, you know, one of the few feathered dinosaurs that this has really been done seriously for. There are a few hundred specimens of Anchiornis with good feathers known in museums. So it's still obviously always a judgment call as to whether or not it's worth doing some basically irreparable damage to get some data out. But you can understand how when you got 200, people are willing to let one or two go. Sure. There's like eight pterosaurs with pycnofibers. Oh, wow. It, and I mean eight pterosaurs, not eight of one species. Right. So, you know, the fact that actually people have looked at three is quite incredible. The fact that they haven't done very much and have taken only a couple of little bits is not a big surprise. And again, it's unfortunate that in some ways these animals aren't particularly exciting. And the other problem, of course, is when you're only taking a few little bits, you know, we've all seen plenty of birds which have you know are mostly quite boring and then have really bright wings or a really bright tail or a really bright head so you can pick a dozen spots on the animal and go oh it's just brown but you might have missed the red and green stripes with yellow spots bit right well you bring up the head let's talk about those glorious crests and mm -hmm. the variety of crests and whether you think, even though no research has been done, I don't think, do you think the crest, what, what is the function, and do you see them as where we would expect to find the brighter colors if, in fact, they had them? Yeah, so, so actually, there's quite a lot of research has been done on this, and I think most of it's been done by me, so nice. <laughs> I'm quite happy to talk about this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so for for so yeah, the variety. You know, Pteranodon. Everyone knows it's got this big kind of flat blade off the back of its head. Um, that's actually one species of Pteranodon, Pteranodon longiceps. There's a second one, Pteranodon sternbergi, and that's kind of got like this weird pentagram, pentagonal crest, which kind of sticks vertically off the head, not backwards but up. So there's there's two Pteranodons, and they're already quite different. Um, I mentioned the tapiarids before. They have huge spikes off the top and back of their head, which we know because we found them, have like a fan of skin in between them. Um, some of the earliest pterosaurs have big bony crest on the snout, so on the front of the head between the eyes and the nose. Um, we have things like Nyctosaurus we mentioned earlier. That has an enormous antler. It, it basically has one rod going up and one rod going back, and those rods are about the size of its own wing. So it's almost like it's got three wings, one on the left, one on the right, and one on its head. Um, as far as we know, Nyctosaurus doesn't have skin in between, but it's still an outrageous amount of bone on its head. Um, and on and on and on. Um, there are some which are bone, some which are skin, some which are skin and bone. Um, all kinds of combinations, some of which are very, very big indeed. Um, and basically, they're mostly massive. Um, and for a long time, the assumption for these is that they were something to do with flight. In some way, these helped the animals fly by steering, acting like a rudder on a plane, or a counterbalance to the jaw, so Pteranodon, a Nyctosaurus. The bone sticks out the back, so the head's heavy at the front, the bone's heavy at the back, it kind of helps hold the head in place, and things like this. Um, and that, that idea held sway for really quite a long time, but it was always a terrible idea for the simple reason that you know flying is really hard work it's a lot of effort energetically you, you're pumping your muscles you're at constant risk and if something goes wrong you crash horribly and tend to die particularly if you're very lightly built like a bird um and so anything which is likely to help you steer or is really critical for flight 
is probably going to end up looking the same in all of the animals because you know mechanics of flight are really quite complicated birds look really very similar to each other and they've all kind of got the same wings doing the same thing in the same way and those that do use their legs to steer kind of use their legs to steer in the same way it would be very odd if you know there are 40 different really quite different styles of crest between pterosaurs if all 40 of those helped you steer in the air surely some of those would be better than others and that evolution would naturally select for those and reject the ones which didn't work very well you know how come two species of pteranodon were so <coughs> completely different to each other the other thing is these crests don't show up in babies well if this helps you fly and the babies are flying why haven't the babies got them that can't be right. So the obvious conclusion or counter argument to this is that it's something to do with being an adult and it's something to do with kind of helping you show off that, that these are in some way what we call sexually selected structures. They're like the peacock's tail, the lion's mane, the antlers on deer. They're helping you show off in some way that you're healthy and sexy and you know worth mating with you know you want to pass your genes on um now that does fit with the idea that these turn up in adults and not in juveniles and that they're extraordinarily variable both within species and between species um and so that's the you know the modern thinking of this is that this is this is all about display this is all about advertising um there's actually been some work so one of my PhD students, actually while he was a master's student, we actually looked at the biomechanics of pteranodon. We built a scale model of a pteranodon head with a crest and flew it in a wind tunnel and saw if it could actually counterbalance the head or the jaw or help you steer. And to be honest, it didn't do anything. So growing a big heavy chunk of bone on the back of your head, which doesn't actually affect your flight whatsoever, doesn't seem to be the kind of thing which is going to help you fly. Um, so yeah, th these appear to be basically adverts, and so it's no surprise if, as you suggested, these might be relatively brightly coloured or relatively brightly patterned in most of these animals. Well, do you think that it would be a, a sexual dimorphism in you would only find it either in one sex or the other, or do you think both of the uh, both of the sexes would have the same? Because I guess from a distance, if you're flying. <laughs> <clears throat> if if you're flying and you look across and you see another thing flying, mm. it would seem like that would be an incredible recognizable feature to let you know, hey, this this is one of me. Or do you think it's something that just the males had or just the females had? Um, so pteranodon actually is, again, we've got so many specimens of pteranodon, we can look at this. It does look like pteranodon has... Crested males and uncrested females. It's not quite true. Females have a little bump at the back of the head, but nothing like the males. So they're a group where they appear to be genuinely different. Um, you've also got a thing called Darwinopterus. Darwinopterus is actually the, the first of these pterosaurs that we found, which sits between the pterodactyloids and the non-pterodactyloids. So it's got a big head and a long neck, but it's also got a long tail. Darwinopterus appears to break it down into two groups one of which doesn't have a crest as such but it's got a little kind of weird little filigree of bone running along its nose and we know from other specimens that when you get that filigree of bone there's usually a big soft tissue crest attached to it so we've got little filigree ones and little non-filigree ones and that therefore implies a crested male and an uncrested female we actually for darwinopterus darwinopterus is one of the pterosaurs that we also have eggs for and we actually have a female darwinopterus and we know it's female darwinopterus because she's got two eggs with her one inside oh, and one God. and one outside how exciting is that and she doesn't and that individual doesn't have the filigree so again that appears to be a case where we're showing sexual dimorphism with a crested male and an uncrested female after that it gets very complicated because most of the other pterosaurs are known from so few specimens we can't say very much meaningful about the crests and whether they're in males or females or both um i wouldn't be surprised if it was regularly in both this appears to be the case in dinosaurs i've written extensively about this um and this is called mutual sexual selection so this is where males are advertising to females this is the kind of classic thing that everyone knows males are going hey look at me look at my lovely big head 
aren't I wonderful and trying to attract a mate. But in mutual sexual selection, the females are doing that too. And that's because the males are helping out. If you as a male don't do anything other than father the babies, you want to get as many girls as possible. That's what's going to be best for you. But if you as a male are going to have to look after the eggs and feed the babies and make sure the babies are okay and guard the nest, that's a huge amount of effort. And therefore, you don't want to get lumbered with a duff female who's not very well and will only lay two eggs rather than three and can't bring as much food in because then your baby suffer. So you want the best female. And therefore, females will inevitably evolve big signals to go, hey, look at me, I'm good too. Um, now, that actually is very common in seabirds. Things like puffins, males and females both have big showy beaks. They both show off to each other. They pair up and they both look after the eggs. So I would not be surprised if quite a few pterosaurs had some form of mutual sexual selection where the males were advertising to the females and the females were advertising to the males. But mostly we don't have enough specimens to say very much meaningful. Wow. You know, you've just opened up an entire new world. I guarantee you, for some of the listeners, they will look at, at, at pterosaurs from a totally different perspective. Is there anything on the horizon that you're working on that you can share with us? Any research you're doing that will kind of add to this, the, the amazing world of pterosaurs that is not discussed that much in, in, uh, to the general public, in my opinion? Um, yeah, not, not, not a huge amount. I've got some papers which are certainly relevant. So I've got one that's ongoing looking, we talked about the idea of pterosaurs being able to fly very early out of the egg. Um, a number of people have said that before. I know a whole bunch of paleontologists who think that for various reasons. I, I've got a big data set that I think reinforces that point further. Um, that's in the process. It's it's having a hard time in review, so I don't know when it may or may not come out. Um, but I've, I've kind of already talked about that. Um, I'm in the process of naming, or at least attempting to name, a couple of new species of pterosaur, uh, one from Canada and one from China. Those will also take quite a while to come out. And of course, we'll have to see what my colleagues think. If they disagree and think I've done it wrong, then <laughs> Maybe those names will never come out. The, I've, I've had conversations, obviously, with a bunch of pterosaur people. I've presented these at conferences. No one has come up to me afterwards and threatened me that how dare I do something so stupid. So <laughs> I think those are going to come out eventually as as new names. Um, the, the other one that's relevant is um, a specimen of Ramphorhynchus that I'm working on. So Ramphorhynchus, again, is a very well-known name. Ramphorhynchus is probably the second best-known pterosaur. So as I said, we've, we've got over a 1,000 specimens of Pteranodon, but they're mostly very fragmentary. We've got about 150 Ramphorhynchus, and they're mostly excellent. They're mostly complete. We've got whole skeletons, but they're from the same place as Archaeopteryx, which means they're flat. So we've got 100 good animals, but they're all squidged, which is a real pain. But it means we have an awful lot of them. So we know an awful lot about Ramphorhynchus. Um, and Ramphorhynchus is one of these non-pterodactyloids. It's got a great big long tail. It's got a big head full of teeth, and it ate fish. And we know that because it's got stomach contents full of fish. It kept eating fish. Um, but most of the Ramphorhynchus specimens are very small. This is one of those ones where, again, the babies, we keep finding them well out to sea, so it looks like they're flying. Um, most Ramphorhynchus are, specimens are a metre or so. There's a couple, just a couple, that are around a metre and a half in wingspan. And then there's one which is nearly two metres. So getting on for double the size of a normal animal and, you know, still 30% bigger than two of the really big ones. So there's this one absolute monster. Um, and that's in a collection at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, that's been in the collection for something like 80 years. Um, and everyone just kind of went, oh, it's a giant Ramphorhynchus, and then wandered off and, and left it. And no one ever really did very much. Got, it got a very brief description in the 1920s, um, like two pages, and that was about it. Um, and about 15 years ago, actually, just as I was finishing my PhD, I was invited to do some work on it. But the problem was is that it was a very old specimen, you know, bought in the late 1800s. And whoever had basically got the specimen, the bones out of the rock, hadn't done a very good job, presumably just enough to show what it was and then sell it to the museum. 
Um, and in order to get some really good information out of it, it needed more work. And as these things happen in research and in museums, it basically took the thick end of 15 years for the museum to find the time and find the money to go back and do the extra, you know, because it was weeks of work to basically clear this skeleton up and, and expose it better. But that's finally been done. And so myself and Mark Witten, who literally wrote the book on pterosaurs, if you're into pterosaurs, go and buy his book. It's a few years old, but it's not out of date. It's fantastic. Mark paints better even than he writes. Um, so it's beautifully illustrated as well. Mark and I are working on this thing because... It's absolutely enormous, which is weird for ter for, for a Ramphorhynchus. It's, it's actually very weird for a non-pterodactyloid pterosaur. Um, and it's also kind of 3D. It's a bit squashed, but it's not squashed flat like so many of these others are. So this can hopefully really tell us something about very big Ramphorhynchus, very big non-pterodactyloids generally. How did they get this big? Did they still function the same way? Are they in the kind of the same proportions? Or, you know, things when they get bigger and bigger and bigger usually have to fly a different way because you get heavier much faster than you increase your wingspan. So that can actually stop you being able to fly. Um, so it's a very, very interesting animal. And the work, unfortunately, is at the early stages, although I'd actually tell you a bit more about it. But it's, it's a really interesting specimen and potentially... We don't know till we've done the work, but potentially it's really important for understanding just how big these things could get while sticking to that old body plan of small head, long tail, short wing metacarpal. And that may, may tell us quite a bit about the flight of these things and, and indeed why they died out. Because the Ramphorhynchoids, the non-pterodactyloids, lived alongside the pterodactyloids for a good 20, 30 million years and then vump, gone, and we never saw them again. Um, so at some level they either failed to compete or failed to adapt um, or couldn't get on with life. And we still don't know why that was. And maybe the fact that they couldn't get any bigger had something to do with it. And this animal may shed some light on that. Wow. And like the dinosaurs, all of them go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, right? Yeah. So, yeah, the the, the, the KT extinction, which took out, again, lots of the marine reptiles. It, it actually took out lots of birds and lots of mammals as well. And, yeah, the, the classic non-avian dinosaurs all went. So, too, did the pterosaurs. Um, again, it's an, an oddity. We'd long thought that pterosaurs actually were, were really kind of struggling well before the KT. The Ashdarkids, which we've talked about so much today, um, were one of the last groups we you know we get ashdarkids right up to the kt boundary so it looked like they were doing fine but almost all the other pterosaurs had gone um but recently quite a few more have turned up particularly in morocco um but we now know that okay, quetzalcoatlus like animals were around nyctosaurus and pteranodon like animals were around um and maybe some of the others like the ornithochirid so the the toothed fish eaters like pteranodon were also around so it's still not in huge numbers of either specimens or huge numbers in terms of diversity but when we literally thought we were down to a handful of pterosaurs and they were all ashdarkids there's quite a big jump um and it looks like yeah yet again it's a limitation of the environment we don't have many good real marine sediments going right up to the kt in places where we think pterosaurs are living uh, we do have lots of very good terrestrial ones but pterosaurs there again are mostly ashdarkids and those have the thinnest bone walls of all so they're very hard to find well i hope what people take away from this interview is a whole new look at animals that as we said at the very start of the interview don't receive the the recognition they do and are often used in, in such a minor way in, in books. And, you know, they're, they're always a footnote, but this to me is fascinating, especially with the eggs and the embryos. That that's fascinating. If you would like more information about Dr. David Hone, you can go to his website, which is Dave Hone, D A V E H O N E dot C O dot U K. And you can also follow him on Twitter He's at Dave underscore Hone, H-O-N-E. And um, your website is loaded with stuff. But the thing I would absolutely recommend is for everyone to go out and read uh, that 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 Tyrannosaur book is spectacular. Um, as a matter of fact, I flew 
over to the UK several months ago, and that's the book I took with me. And I read that book you wrote on Tyrannosaurs, which I thought was absolutely spectacularly written. And just to tell you something really funny, last night I was Skyping with a friend of mine, a young man that lives in the UK. I mean, I'm sorry, in the Netherlands. And I mentioned to him, hey, I'm getting ready to interview Dr. Hone on pterosaurs. And he jumps off screen and he jumps back and he holds up your books and he goes, love him. <laughs> so so that's, the, cool. that's yeah. always nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I would encourage anyone to to go on there, find any of the books that you've written. You write, you write article after article. Is there a pterosaur book on the horizon for us? From me, no, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, I kind of planned to do one. And then, as I say, my, my friend Mark Witten went and wrote one. And <laughs> I honestly think it's probably better than a book that I can write. Um, because, well, because the one problem I do have is I, I spread myself thin. So I do do lots of work on pterosaurs, but I also do lots on tyrannosaurs. And I do quite a lot on some other dinosaurs as well. And Mark is probably 95 plus percent a pterosaur researcher. So he's actually more up on some of the real technical details and obscure bits of the literature than I am. Right. And as I say, he's a brilliant artist. And he, I literally got his book and, and read it and went, I think I'd struggle to do better. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, he, he, kind of, he kind of beat me to the punch on that <laughs> one. So, I, I mean, give, give it another four or five years, and if he doesn't do a second edition, I'll, I'll have a real heavy think about it. Um, but it... it you know, Mark is a good friend of mine, but that is a that is a, a brilliant book. And if you want to know pterosaurs, you will go from naught to expert across a couple of hundred pages, and it's it's well worth getting hold of. Well, wow, that's that's exciting. Well, we we appreciate you, Doctor Hone, coming back on for a second time to talk with us. And and as always, if there's ever anything new and exciting you'd like to share, we would absolutely love to uh, to have you. And I would encourage anybody. If you get the opportunity to hear uh, Dr. Hone speak live, he is as dynamic as you would expect, uh, and it's absolutely worth it. Dr. Hone, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to do this with us. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. You it was bet. Fun. All right, you guys, that was it. And I've got some really, really exciting news. If his schedule will allow... Dr. Hone has agreed to do a second part interview on pterosaurs. There was so much information to cover, we simply couldn't do it all. So he's very graciously agreed uh, to try to do a follow-up. And that follow-up could come as soon as a day from now. So hopefully that will be the case and um, I'll be able to, to post it quickly. For everybody out there, thank you so much for hanging around, even though you haven't heard anything from me for a year, and I feel terrible that it's been that long. But uh, anyway, I'm back at least for a while before I'm back on the road, and I wish you all the very best New Year, 2000, or 2019, 2019. I wish you and your families the very best. Remember, take care of yourselves and take care of the people around you. There's only one world, and we might as well make it as good a one as we can. So thank you all so very much, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past.